Hi everyone, I'm John Zimmerman, founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and today is Tuesday, August 31st, 2021, and you've tuned in to the Active Towns Culture of Activity channel. Today I have a special video podcast episode featuring Chuck Marone of the Strong Towns Organization and author of the upcoming book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. Today, he's actually giving a couple presentations here in the city of Austin, Texas, and I'll be live streaming that event from our public library at 6 p.m. Central. So if you happen to be catching this video prior to that time, be sure to tune in on the live stream, or you can always come back and watch the recording of that event later on. So without further ado, let's get rolling with this conversation with Chuck Marone. Chuck, it's so wonderful to connect with you here once again today yeah. on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks, man. It's nice to be back. You know, um, in anticipation, I, I forgot to mention this before we started. I have my, uh, I don't know what if this is a net gator or what this is, but I know we're doing video, so I thought I would, I thought I would put this on. This is my... Oh. You really don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> My active town's net gator. I, I do. I, I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, that is a net gator, and uh, I, I had those those guys made. There, I actually find net gators. It's a microfiber net gator. I find them really, really helpful in the winter time. And oh, in in uh, the harsh winters of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, thanks. I think thanks for rubbing it in. I have yeah. shorts and sandals on, and I think we are today in Minnesota at like 55 degrees at your like low temp for the winter. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's funny you should mention that because, of course, we had our, our deep freeze here. Mm. And that became like a major, major event because, of course, the the very, very fragile energy network that we have right, here collapsed. Right. And so yeah. we had no power. Uh, you know, we were below freezing for an entire week and we had no power for an entire week. So right. we had a little bit of that fragility um, you know, yeah. hooking through. Well, let's do this. Um, so you were one of my first guests uh, when I launched the podcast. So back in April of 2020, you were on, it was, I think, episode number 13. Yeah. And we had a really, really deep <laughs> and in-depth conversation about your background and about the origins of Strong Towns. And um, I'm going to encourage, uh, because we have a lot of new listeners, you know, kind of tuning in. And yep. uh, this is going to be a video podcast, too. So uh, if, if folks are, are listening right now, but you'd rather see our smiling faces, then definitely pop on over to the video version of this over on the YouTube channel. Um, but why don't we do this? Rather than us hashing over a lot of our, our deep history and, and, and fun times together, uh, take a moment just to give a very, very brief uh, introduction of yourself and Strong Towns, and then we'll shift gears and talk about the new book. Cool. Yeah. Well, Strong Towns is a 501c3 nonprofit, and, and it started with me writing a blog back in 2008, trying to explain uh, and, and, and explain, put together some thoughts in my head about why our cities were going broke, why our development pattern, the way we actually go out and, and assemble our cities was not creating the prosperity that we had been promised. Um, that took off and some friends of mine encouraged me to start a nonprofit. Uh, they, they helped me do that. Uh, I got some funding and some support from a foundation here in Minnesota. I started getting asked to go speak around the country and, and fast forward now, uh, we run essentially a media company, a media organization, a media nonprofit, where we are trying to shift the conversation in this country about growth, investment, infrastructure spending, uh, local government, the role of local government, how we build cities that are strong and successful and prosperous. Uh, our website has two and a half million unique readers in the last year. We've got three different podcast streams. We do a bunch of video work. And uh, we're, we're looking at now uh, what the next step is for Strong Towns because there, there's such a movement that has been built now around these ideas and doing things differently that we're feeling kind of pushed and, and, and compelled to help people uh, not just raise awareness, but actually go out and, and do some of this stuff in their community. We, we've seen people do all kinds of amazing stuff inspired by strong towns and, and we'd like to now i think in this next phase make that a little bit easier for communities that are, that that are that are strong towns curious but maybe don't have the capacity yet to do it to take those those prudent steps right right now 
when we spoke in April 2020, we, we did also talk about the first book. So The Bottom-Up Revolution to Rebuild American Prosperity uh, was out. Uh, I believe you were in the midst of yeah. kind of a book tour <laughs> than the pandemic hit. Am I yeah. remembering no, the insane, about right? Yeah, insane book tour. Um, this one will, might be, it's not going to be as insane as that one. I, I think I gave 70 speeches in like two and a half months. And then we took a little break and then I went right back out on the road and that came to a screeching halt in March of 2020, right? Uh, when everything did. And so, yeah, we've been, I've not really done much traveling since then. Um, but uh, starting here now with the book coming out September 8th, we're gonna be back on the road again. We, we've had a couple things cancel. We've had a couple of shift venues. Uh, but we're hoping to be able to power through this and uh, and yeah, do a good book tour for the, the next three months to the end of the year and then pick it up again in, in 2022, I guess is what it would be. So yeah, but but new book, new presentation, new uh, format. It'll be kind of exciting. It's exciting. You know this. I mean, you've done a lot of travel with your work. Um, it, it's been very nice to be home. With my family, it's been very nice to have this period of, of what to me has been downtime. I'm, I'm not trying to overlook the suffering people have gone through in this pandemic, but professionally, this has been kind of a, a breather for me. And I'm kind of ready now for the frenetic pace to pick back up again, and we'll see. Right, right. Now, if I remember correctly, um, when we last saw each other, uh, it was still part of the book tour and I think you had mentioned that this book was already underway. Oh yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so, it, so, so for those people who are unfamiliar with the first book, um, is there just a really quick way as a synopsis? Because yeah. if I give my synopsis to it, I would say that it was like a, a wonderful overview of the organization of some of the key tenets of the strong towns movement um but you didn't necessarily go deep and so when you and i spoke and you you said yeah no we we've i've got another one booking or you know cooking and we'll yeah. be coming and we're going to dive deep into transportation is it is it appropriate to say that that first book was sort of an overview oh yeah and yeah. then we're going to see more deep dives into some of the key tenants so when i when i pitched the proposal to wiley publishing it was a little bit like george lucas pitching star wars you know he pitched this like six part thing and they're like we're not going to do six you know give us the best one and i pitched a five part series um the first one is kind of a strong towns 101 the financial backdrop of how we build successful human habitat and what that means and, and how we make that shift. And so it's a, it's a lot about the finance of cities, why cities have struggled, uh, get a little bit into the infrastructure cult and uh, complex adaptive systems and, and how we start to transition to a platform for building cities that are, are strong and prosperous. Um, book number two is all about transportation. And so for those of you that, that know the term Strodes that we came up with, there's, I don't even think it's mentioned in the first book. The second book, there's a whole chapter and it, it repeats many times throughout the, the conversation about Strodes keeps coming up uh, because it's such a central part of the, the transportation conversation. Um, the third book, which is actually in the works right now being written, being put together, uh, Daniel Harrigus and I are working on it together. It's gonna be about housing. Fourth one will be about economic development. And then if we uh, are privileged enough to do five, it will be on urban design. So that's the the, the kind of series that we originally envisioned uh, to get this message out. And, and I think what's maybe most different about this one is at the end of every chapter, we actually have action steps. Like here's here's the story and the narrative we're telling, but then, you know, here's actually what you go out and do do. Here's how you change things. Here's how you physically do something different. Um, so this one's a little bit more actionable, like directly actionable than, than the first one. Right, right. Now the full title of the new book is Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, Transportation for a Strong Town. Uh, dive a little deeper into that title. Why confessions? Yeah. I th there's really a couple reasons. The, the first one is I, I want to, 
I, I, I want to be able to bring people along uh, who are wedded to the system today, who, who intellectually don't have uh, much uh, problem with the way we do transportation today. And I, I, I use the, uh, the, the term confession to kind of denote that, you know, there, there is a, a different path in a sense. Like there's a, here's one way of doing things and, and, and I make the case in here that it's wrong and I'm gonna confess that it's wrong. And, and, and I confess it because I'm not looking at this as someone apart from the people who are doing things in, in a way that I find to be very injurious. I want to acknowledge that I was part of that system. Like I did that. I'm there. I'm I'm not holding myself out as better than you or more informed than you or more intelligent than you. Uh, I'm just, you know, saying here's an alternate way that we need to look at things. And and by confession, I hope that the humility comes through and allows people to to bridge that gap. I also want, uh, for, especially for non-technical people, for them to have a moment where they feel like the in the Wizard of Oz, like the curtain has been pulled back, you know, like you, you, an engineer is kind of one of those, in a way, prestige professions. I don't think that's right, but I think that it, in our society it is. Engineers are tended to look at as being trustworthy, as being, you know, uh, you know valuable. It's, it's a difficult degree to get in some ways. And so there's a certain amount of prestige that comes along with it. And I think as, as professionals, we hide behind that and we, uh, I think, do a disservice to ourselves as a profession and to society when we do. And so the confession part is a little bit of, a, 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 you know, an allusion to the idea that I'm pulling back the curtain and I want you to be able to see some of these deep, dark secrets of the profession that even we struggle to acknowledge. Right, right. Now, you, you have a little something out there right now called the 30 Days of Confessions. What's that all about? <laughs> well, we, you know, in, in putting this together, um, we want, we, th there's, some, there's some technical reasons why it's good for a book to have a big launch. We, we're a movement building organization and the algorithms uh, of book sales do really well when you can have a big surge at the beginning. And, and the reason you write a book when you're an organization like us is to transmit a message out. And so we're trying to ride the wave of the algorithm to get the message out as far as we can. And one of the pre-order incentives we came up with was this 30 Days of Confessions videos. So I went out around my hometown of Brainerd and I put together, you know, I, I did, they're like 60 to 90 second little bits where I share an insight from the book and, and we, we set out to do 30 and I'm like, can I do 30? And I wound up doing 34. And it was so much fun to be able to just kind of summarize in a little bit longer than a tweet, a, a key insight. Um, our video team here is amazing and they put them together in these really great videos. And if you go and, and pre-order the book, uh, you can sign up on the confessions.engineer website and we'll send you every day for 30 days in a row uh, one of these videos and they're they're cool. They're very shareable. They're very fun. I Usually don't like how I look and sound on video, but they did such a good job with these that they're pretty cool Yeah, well, I will I do have to say though that I think you look better now than yeah. you did when you uh, were, were doing those videos because now you have just like this glow of somebody who just <laughs> got back from vacation <laughs> Yeah, well, that when we did those, I had to wear a monkey suit, and it was hot, and it was outside, and uh, you know, it was a long day. But yeah, now I, I mean, I just got back from. It's the calm before the storm, right? Um, my family, I've got two daughters, and so there's basically like a two week window in the summer where you can take a trip, after act, summer activities are done, before school and fall activities start, and uh, we were fortunate enough to go to Italy for a couple weeks. So I feel. I'll tell you this. I haven't told anybody this. Um, I, we were there for 12 days. Of course, you're in Italy, so I ate like a king, right? Like I just ate like nobody's business. I lost four pounds in, uh, in 12 days. And it's just because the food is so good, it's not fatty, and you walk so much. And uh, it's astounding what those two things do. And I'm actually, uh, you know, down 15 pounds for the year. So that was not like easily lost weight, but in the, the, the Mediterranean lifestyle is just so beautiful. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and you're absolutely right. You're you're about ready to embark on um, a, another massive book tour. You alluded to it just earlier. Next week, we're fortunate enough to to have you here. We're in, kicking in it the city off in of Austin. Austin. Yeah, you're kicking it off here in Texas, in in the Austin area, and so we're we're very privileged and honored to have you there. But. It was important that you did take that time um, to, to get away with the family and what better place to do it than, no kidding. You know, than Italy. While you were there mm-hmm. and, and then coming back from that, because, I mean, the book's done. I mean, it's, it's out there. It's going to be here September 8th. What sort of thoughts in your mind while you were walking around everywhere that were, were just like, yeah, that, uh, we were spot on in the book with this. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Part, part of the act of writing a book is that at a certain point, it becomes out of your control, right? You you lose control of it. And you have to give, you have to cede control to others. And that's a, that's a difficult thing. As I'm walking in Italy and as I'm spending time, we, we went to Rome and we went to Venice and we did day trips from there. So we got to see some very nice places. The The thing that, it is the most rewarding for me is that I get to watch them through my daughter's eyes. So I have these two kids, they're 14 and 16. They do not want to be an engineer. They do not want to be a city planner. They do not, they think dad's work is dorky. They don't want anything to do with dad, but we're walking through and they've, they've had, you know, a dozen years of absorbing this stuff. They start talking about, look at this street. Look at the cobblestones. Wow, there's no cars here. Look at how slow the cars drive through this area. Look at how people just walk in the middle of the street. Look, and, and so for them to, to be very American, they're very American kids. They've gotten two trips overseas now, one to London, Paris, and then one to Rome, Venice. Um, to, to have them, in a sense, narrate their experience and, and, and to have them recognize not just that it's different, but kind of some of the components that make it different um, is, is so beautiful. And I, I think the one that stands out to me, there, there's two that stand out to me. One, they're at this age with their phones where they're always taking pictures. And, and of course, they're teenage girls, so they take these like glamour shots, like stand there and pose and all this. And, and they would find these, we would be walking along and they would see these side streets. They'd be like, that's a great, that's going to be a great photo. And so they would want these photos on these great, you know, it would be like a 12 foot wide alley and they would be standing there. And in America, you would never do that because it'd be a grotesque place. But in Rome, it was such a beautiful part of the fabric. And then when we got to Venice, um, they both independently remarked, it is so quiet here. And it's so quiet. Cities are very, very quiet places. Cars are really loud. And so we kind of associate cities with noise because, you know, cities have lots of uh, high concentration of cars. But the reality is cities are quiet. It's cars that are loud. And when you go to Venice and there's no cars, they're like, this is so delightful. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what did they have to do to get rid of the cars in Venice? <laughs> they put in places for boats, man. It, it's, it, it is kind of, it, it's funny because, you know, you, you have this history of, of Venice and its development and it's, you know, building around canals and there was defensive reasons to do this. And it's, it's left us with this magical place. But if you even go to Rome and go to the, cause we, we were lucky enough to stay in the very heart of Rome. So we were American, like three blocks from the Pantheon. I mean, we were right in the middle of everything, of ancient Rome. And, you know, I don't know what we would have done as Americans, but the Romans did not tear down central Rome to build roads through it. They basically resized their vehicles to fit in these tiny streets. And some of them just don't accommodate cars. So, you know, too bad. And they've accepted that. Like that's an okay trade-off for them. So you, you, you wind up in these spaces. And I, I think w- Chloe is uh, my oldest. Um, part of the agreement we have with her I won't go into the whole agreement, but it has to do with classes. And, you know, you can understand I'm a dad. I'm, you, you, we're beyond punishment. We're now into incentives. So one of the incentives is that I'm going to get her a car. And I'm going to get her a car at some point in the next eight months. 
so as we were there, I keep pointing out the car. Like, I'm going to get you that car right there. And it would be these like little tiny cars. And after a while, she started to like them. She's like, yeah, I could, I could take, you know, Stella to school in that, or I could ride in that. That'd be cool. Um, oftentimes here in the U.S., we, we don't think of the car as being a malleable thing that comes in different sizes that could actually be size. You know, they had garbage trucks and police cars and fire trucks that fit in these tiny, tiny streets. And like, well, they don't come in that size. Yeah, there they do. Here they are. Yeah. 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 And I and obviously I was saying that tongue in cheek. Oh, about I know. Venice, Venice yeah. never had cars, and and some people may not know that, but Venice is, a, you know, a historic city built on a, a quarter mile grid, you know, pattern, and is is a walkable place. I, do, do they even let bikes in there? Are no, in there's Venice? no bikes. There's no. Yeah, so it's com- completely no scooters, pedestrian. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll tell you what the the coolest thing we did on this trip, um, we paid for a kayak tour. I've never seen anyone kayak in Venice. And even the whole time we were there, I kept looking to see if anyone else kayaked. I never saw a kayak. We got a kayak, like I kayaked in the freaking Grand Canal and we went through all the like little, it was the most amazing view of Venice ever. Um, But that was the only non like small boat, the water taxis, and then the gondolas, that was the only transportation I saw was our kayaks. That was not one of those other three forms of, of movement. Yeah. And, uh, and Chris and, and, and Melissa Bruntlett talk a little bit about this in their new book that just came out, um, the chapter on the hearing city mm-hmm. and just how quiet it is when you're in a city that you know has fewer automobiles or no automobiles whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It was one of the things that... Uh, uh, really struck me when I visited um, uh, Mackinac Island. Oh yeah, um, back in 2013 when I visited you um, uh, up in Brainerd, and then I did the the, the northern route over the UP and and, and dropped in and visited uh, Mackinac. It, it was just astounding what it's like to be in a place where there's absolutely no motor vehicles, right. and you're like, wow, you can actually hear people and birds and things. So I I grew up on a farm. And my wife grew up on a lake. And then when we got married, we moved to this five acre plot in the middle of the woods. And you'd been to that house. Um, That house was actually loud. Uh, And it was loud, you know, not only because like the bullfrogs and all that um, were kind of loud and obnoxious, but uh, you know, there was a highway not too far from there. and, And you could hear the cars at night going through. When we moved to town, we moved in the middle of the city five years ago. And my wife was one of her hesitations in doing that was it's just going to be loud. Our house today in the middle of town, in the middle of the historic Brainerd, you know, four blocks from the downtown, right in where the, you know, the original plat of the city is so much quieter than where we used to be. And a lot of it is because if you're driving through town on that same highway uh, out on the edge, you're driving 60 miles an hour. That's what we were getting here in town you're driving much slower and it's actually a lot quieter yeah yeah and they actually address that in in their book too they talk about the fact that once you get over a certain speed it's it's no longer the noise from the engine it's actually the noise the wind tires yeah yeah it's this friction wind kind of thing yeah no exactly it's it it's funny because we, we have all of these environmental regulations. And if you if you were to open like a, you know, a, a, a processing plant of some type, you would be required to meet noise regulations if you were next to a residential neighborhood. Um, but you can run a highway that vastly exceeds noise pollution standards. And there's no, you know, there's there's there, there, there's there's no issue with that, really. Right. So you mentioned the, the, the five acre parcel, you know, out there uh, in the exurban area and the fact that you made that move into town, but then you also channeled the fact that you're, you're walking a lot more, you've dropped a bunch of weight. It can compare and contrast that because it's, it's a recurring theme throughout the book that you keep bringing it back to is that, you know, is your community walkable and bikeable? And, you know, that's, you just, you had a major, major life shift. Yeah. Yeah. You were no longer, your commute is completely different. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, let me give you what I think is the most 
to, to me was the, the, the most compelling thing. Um, it, this is a dumb story, but I like to, I coach softball. My girls play softball. They don't anymore. They've gotten too old. This is the last season. Um, but when I would bring Chloe, the oldest one into town when she was younger to play softball, there was once when she forgot her glove. And she's a lefty, so she has a left hand, a glove that is the opposite hand of what everybody else on the team and myself have. And so if she forgets her glove, at that point, it was a 45 minute round trip back to our house. Um, it was a little over 20 minutes to get across town, back out to the far exurban place, get in and get back in. And so if she forgot her glove, she was just not gonna play. Like that was it. Like you, by the time we had driven there and back, it would have been, almost over and there was no sense in it. So she could hit, but she couldn't play. Um, there were many times where kids forgot stuff now that we live in town and, you know, mom would bike to the park and she'd just be like, oh, I'll just I'll bike home and get your whatever, your batting gloves or your water bottle or whatever. And I think it made them a little bit lazier because they didn't have, to, you know, there were, there were less consequences to forgetting something here. Um, but the, re the reality is, is, you know, I gained about three and a half to four hours a week uh, just in commuting time. And I actually had to throttle down my commute because when I, we first moved to town, I was biking and I would get to work too soon. And I found that I was not getting enough meditation time and enough like listening to, uh, to audio books, which I'd like to do when I'm, you know, my, my audio book consumption went way down. But my weight went down too, and and I've I've now adopted a routine with a little bit intentionally longer walk, not really biking anymore, but walking, because I I I like that time. But it's I mean I walk home for lunch, I walk back. It, it's it's a completely different lifestyle, and it's one that uh, is is more intimate, more intentional and less like frenetic. I, I, I feel less spread thin and more kind of purposeful in, in what I do. And you know, I also, I, we, we lived at the place we were at before for 15 years. I knew my neighbor's name. If I saw them at the grocery store or something, I would say hi, but I didn't really know them. Um, my, my direct neighbors. I, I know people all throughout my neighborhood now. I talk to them all the time. You you just see them. You become part of their lives. I walk by my church. You know, my church is right across the street from the office. I walk back and forth in front of. I probably I, I cross it at least twice a day, and sometimes four or six times a day. And for me, that's a it's a very um, it's a very nice thing to be able to do to have that contact and 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 that uh, you know that intimacy with with uh, with my church. I walk through the park in the middle of the town. And while, you know, I've done some podcasts recently about how the park frustrates me uh, and there's some design things that drive me nuts. The reality is, is it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful park and it's nice to be there, see the people there, interact with my neighbors. And of course, I live in Minnesota and every January, February, we get a couple weeks where it's it doesn't get above zero. It's 20 below, 25 below. Um, and I walk then too. And the, the idea of walking in when it's 95, the idea of walking when it's 20 below, uh, that has in many ways made me a stronger, healthier person. And I can feel that, like I can feel that um, way different than getting into a preheated car and driving 20 minutes somewhere and, and then getting into a car with AC and driving somewhere. It's you know, I, I can tell when I'm around my friends and they're annoyed by the heat or annoyed by the the the, the cool that it doesn't it doesn't bother me and it doesn't bother me because I'm I'm acclimated to it, right? Right, right. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot here a little. Yeah, bit go for and, it. And and see how you respond to this. I think that this is a different book because of your current reality of walking as much as you are than you would have written if you were still living in the other place. What, what, what do you, how do you respond to that? He, when you came here in 2013, uh, we were living in the, the other house and my experiences in my hometown uh, were all drive and get out. Um, so they were, they were all, walking was a, a secondary activity, not a primary activity. 
And, and biking was a recreational activity, not a transportation activity. And you said to me something that was absurd. You said, Brainerd is a great biking town. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like that's that's you you are so wrong. Like John, like he's, and 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 I, I said that with some degree of scorn and confidence because I'm like, well, maybe it is for you because you really bike, you're really into that. But for me, as someone who, you know, uh has to be here, it, it's not. It's a terrible biking town. And then I moved here and I'm like, oh my gosh, this place is awesome. It it's a it's a great biking town. It's a great walking community, especially my neighborhood, which is the old traditional neighborhood that's still, um, I, I'll say this, because the, neighbor, the, the, the part of town I moved in tends to be the most affluent part of town. We're still talking houses that are 200,000 as a, you know, you go out to where I was before and those were lake homes that were a million dollars or whatever. I'm in, the, I'm in the rich part of the poor city. Um, but because it's the nicer part of town, the, the 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 people there did not allow the city to take out their sidewalks. If you go to the poorer parts of town, the sidewalks have all been gutted, taken out, um, and and you know for what for a, a multiple reasons. But in, here in this neighborhood, it is b gorgeous to walk. It is it is more enjoyable to walk here than it was in the old place where we would walk through the woods and on the you know uh, on the golf courses and everything else. Uh, this place is a great walking and biking neighborhood. And it's been that five years of experience that has allowed me to see what you saw and certainly has, um, I don't think changed the center core thrust, but what it has done is it has added this flavor to my writing and a flavor to my, my insights that I, I otherwise would not have had, would have been more... Um, clinical and less experiential. My, my experience has been a lot different now. And, and, and even, I'll say this, when we first moved here, the idea of walking downtown um, was something that I kind of committed to doing because we're, we're moving to the city, you know, and we were six blocks from the downtown or what have you, from the core. Um, is not very far, but it's, there's parts of it that are not a nice walk. Crossing the highway through the middle of town is not nice. Um, it's not pleasant. I've, I've, I've been, it's been remarkable to me how much just doing that over and over and over again has made the 12 block walk and the 18 block walk and the, the, the two mile walk so much easier, right? It's like, that's not far at all now. And even to my neighbors who I, I love them and they're, they're wonderful people. Um, but you know, we live in a place where it's easier to drive than to walk. And they predominantly drive everywhere and they think I'm kind of nuts for walking those six blocks. Um, but gosh, once you walk those six blocks over and over, it does change your perspective on things um, in, in, in fundamental ways that, yeah, I, I hope come through in the book. I think they do. And, and w what I kind of, you know, noticed about it is that there was this personal experience and authenticity that, that just came through because you were actually walking the talk. You weren't just talking about these tenets of, of urbanism and, and, you know, traditional development patterns and the fact that theoretically people walked a lot of places right. and, and did <laughs> stuff, you know? It's like you would actually get to places under your own power. You'd jump on the bike and go to the ice cream shop, you know, yeah. it, with the kids. You know, it, it's like there there's a level there of authenticity. And it's not to say that Brainerd doesn't have huge challenges. You do. You've you've got a Tremendous. massive strode ru yeah. running right through, you know, separating your community, your neighborhood from you know the old historic downtown. Right. So let's talk a little bit about that part of the book because it gets to the the heart of the challenge that cities are having, not just in North America but around the globe, of trying to reverse the damage that has been done by the autocentric you know, car brain. Right. <laughs> Ann Sussman is going to be this week's uh, uh, episode. Oh, in, and she talked about, uh, you yeah. know, car brain. And I was like, oh, that's right. brilliant. Uh, yeah, car yeah. brain. Yeah. It, it's so I, I, I try to be and I get criticized for this sometimes. I try to be as generous as I can to the people of the past that made these decisions. And I, I do that for two reasons. One, we're screwing up a ton of stuff today, and I hope the people of the future are generous to us, you know, because we're doing the best we can in, in many ways. Um, 
But I also think it's 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 helpful to try to understand what motivated them. And and we had this, you know, the Great Depression, we had World War II, we had some existential crises of who we were and what we were going to become. And we chose to respond to those crises in ways that were probably logical at the time. Probably, you know, I think, you know, this was certainly we can go back and pick out people who oppose this stuff. But for the most part, society was fully on board with let's empty out our cities. Let's create suburbia. Let's um, give everybody their own property and their own, you know, path. And, and I think for a generation like my grandfather's that suffered through the Great Depression, um, something that even today economists don't really fully understand what caused it or how to get out of it. The idea that they could create an economic program of building that would both energize uh, the free market and create kind of this government safety net that would, would help people um, while simultaneously giving people this autonomy and independence that that it's kind of like the, you know, we've, we've, we've nostalgized with the, the term the American dream. This is a very powerful concept. I, I think that what we are seeing today is in many ways like the zombie version of this, right? Um, this died in 2008. I think it died in 1995. I, there are multiple times where this vision died. And instead of burying it in the ground, mourning, and then moving on to like the next generation of things, we like weekend at Bernie's it, we like propped it up and we like made it into this zombie thing that we're gonna just keep doing this. We're gonna keep going in this direction. We're gonna keep trying to generate economic growth in our economy and jobs and economic development by building more frontage roads and more interchanges and more highway lanes. Um, simultaneous with that, there, there, there has been, and Strong Towns is part of this, and A Active Towns is part of this, and I think there are other groups that have been on the forefront of this too. There's this growing acknowledgement that we would actually have greater prosperity, greater wealth, greater capacity. We, 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 the, the, the things that inspired us to do the suburban project at the end of World War II, um, we, we actually could achieve more of those goals today if we put the zombie in the ground, let it let it pass away, let it dece and, and did something different. And I, I, I feel like what we're watching right now is what what Ben Hunt calls the the common knowledge game. Um, you know and I know that we would be better off walking more as a society. You know and I know that you would be better off, uh, you know, financially our cities would be, if, if we built them in a more traditional way instead of the post-World War II cul-de-sac-y way. Like financially, they're, they're, they're winners. My city council knows this. Like all of them know and understand this. The problem is that they know that everybody else doesn't agree with them on that. They, they in a sense, look out and say, you know, let me, let me put this, I'm gonna buy and build a suburban home not because that's what I want or that's what my preference is, but because that's where the resale value is. I'm not gonna move to the core of Brainerd. It's funny because when we moved to the core of Brainerd, a ton of people said to us, one, that's gutsy, you're crazy. And then two, ah, I would really like to live there. And, and the, the dichotomy of that is the one was like, you're taking a big financial risk and you're going to a neighborhood that's not as nice a neighborhood and oh, there's crime and there's no crime. Oh, there's traffic, oh, there's no traffic. You know, they, they had all these narratives, but they also said, I'd like to do it. And what they were doing is they were saying, this is a lifestyle I want, but I don't think the rest of society wants this. And so I'm not ready to do it. And I think the shift is gonna happen really radically when we start to realize that what we want and what we experience and we want a nice walkable neighborhood and a nice safe place and we want good neighbors and we want to be able to, to meet them and see them and, and be part of a community. I think when we recognize that everybody else wants that too, there will be the same kind of big shift in our, our, our approach that we saw at the end of World War II. Um, where, you know, that kind of zombie gets laid to rest and we actually embark from the bottom up and from the top down on a brand new kind of version of America. Right, right. 
It's interesting, too, with those dates that you mentioned, you know, 1995, 2008, and then, of course, where we are now in 2020. Um, I reflect back and, and, and think about the fact that not only did we keep the zombie going and, and, and stay committed to the, the thought process of throughput of motor vehicles and, and level of service and all of these things that are, that are driving uh, many of the, uh, the factors that in, 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 in the thought processes that of the planners and the engineers. But, but we also saw the massive supersizing of motor vehicles during that same period of time right. across those, those, uh, those points. Right. Just, you know, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, the small <laughs> compact size of motor vehicles, you know, over in Italy, yeah. you know, you, you compare them to, um, you, you know, what we have here in North America. And, and and there's some relevance too because you know even in your book you you talk a little bit about in the final chapter you talk about you know your confession and you go through that experience of um, you know a, a couple of different car crashes right. and uh, and and you and I have the same quote unquote SUV which is you know nowhere near the size of these monstrous yeah. behemoths that are out there. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I'm going with all of this other than to say that just popped into my head when you, you know, talked about the zombie thing well, and, and the, the, the dates of 1995 and 2008 we, you and look, what we've seen happen. Right. From, okay. In, in, in finance, in finance, there's a thing called a blow off top and a blow off top is like the market is frenetically going up. It's going up. It's beyond what it should be. It's like a big bubble. And you're like, this has got to end. And at some point, there's this last kind of frenetic insanity where you get this blow off top, where you'll go to highs that are unimaginable. And what that is doing is it's actually squeezing everybody out of the market. So you, you sit in there and you're like, okay, well, I think that, you know, pick your stock. Uh, Facebook is worth $100 a share, and then it goes to 150, and then it goes to 200. And all of a sudden you're like, I can't buy in because it's too rich for me. And what happens is there becomes this frenetic pace where you go up and up and up and up and up. And, and the last people who would buy in get squeezed out, and then it loses its momentum and it crashes. That's a, called a blow off top. When I step back and I look at the size of automobiles, when I look at the size of our infrastructure construction, when I look at the, the current, you know, infrastructure bill being debated in Congress and we're throwing around, you know, trillions of dollars. When, when, when you and I were in our early, you know, early years in our 20s and, and 30s, the idea of spending like $20 billion or $30 billion is a huge sum of money. And now we're like, ah, you know, $4 trillion, $5 trillion, like well, whatever. Um, to me, this feels... Uh, in many dimensions, like a blow off top. And I do think that at some point we will look back at, you know, this final phase of the massive SUV and, and, and just say, well, that, that was crazy. Like that, that was nuts, you know? And so I, yeah, I don't look at it as a trend. I do look at it as like a, a blow off top, you know? And it, you saw this. I mean, we we had Honda Honda Elements, which which quite frankly I think is the greatest car ever made. They don't make them anymore, which is really sad. I've got a HRV now, which is a smaller SUV, but kind of like the descendant of the the Element. Um, if you go back to two thousand eight, uh, the Hummer went away for a while. Uh, the big cars, because remember we had four dollars a gallon gas. Um, you know, when I was in Italy, gas was like nine fifty a gallon or something like that. I did the conversion once, and it was you know, it, 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 we will not have that insane that that blow off top size stuff when the economy shifts, and I I think it is kind of inevitable that that will happen. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that nostalgia that you know you just mentioned, where some of your your friends and, and relatives or whatever are just like you know. Oh wow! You know, that's kind of neat. You know, <laughs> we might want to do that too. You know, it, it it's because we do have a fair amount of the the nostalgia associated with car culture, but then there's also a nostalgia um, of of what it was like when you did know your neighbors and when you could walk to to downtown and 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 
kids could walk to school and, and things of that nature. It seems like that is starting to percolate back up, and we are starting to see, especially in, in, in some of the, the more dynamic real estate markets like here in Austin, if you're within walking and biking distance to downtown, you know, your real estate prices are, are very much higher than, you know, if you are car dependent. Right. So there's something there. Well, let, let's let me let me give you the the disenfranchised Gen Xer view of this. Mm -hmm. um, you, you and I both grow up. You're a Gen Xer, too, right? I mean, you we're, we're not too. Yeah. 1965. So it was the first year. Yeah. yeah so I'm 73. Um, you know, I'm kind of right in the, the middle of this all. Um, we live in this world that's been defined for us by baby boomers and is being redefined by millennials. And you know, you look at those two massive cohorts, there's there's all these jokes that Xers share amongst each other. For those of you who are not Gen X, um, we're the overlooked generation and all this. And there'll be these things where it's like, uh, they'll put up, you know, stats about different generations and they'll they'll skip X. Like they won't even put us in. They'll put boomers and millennials and, and Z. And it's like, well, wait a sec. There's a whole cohort of like people that are missing from that. Yeah, we're, the, we're the lost overlooked. I feel like we're we're defined on, on both ends by these groups. And so I, 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 I sense that you're right, that there is a shift today. I feel. I don't ascribe like nostalgic reasons or like a reawakening of America or what have you. I think it's the place where these two generations are at right now. The baby boomers are through their working years. They're into their retirement years now. That retirement can either be done alone in isolation, which is what they did in their working years, or it can be done in community. And, and obviously when you're at that point in life and your kids have moved out and they're remote, the, the, those connections are so meaningful and they're so important and they're so valuable that what I have seen is a lot of people at that age group kind of migrating to places where they can have that lifestyle. It's a very attractive lifestyle for someone in, in that age group. I think what we see with millennials, and I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a little bit easier to caricature the millennial because you know, they've grown up in this digital space. They're always connected. They're always on, um, you know, they, they, they've, they've got their smartphones, but no cars. I think there's a lot of reasons why an urban style of life fits them well. Um, part of it is because they're at the age where they're looking for someone to, you know, swap DNA with. And so there's, there's that aspect of social meeting people. Um, but there's also just, I, I, you know, I think the economics of the fact that uh, if, if you're going to live in a, a single family home out in the suburbs, you're going to be pretty alone and pretty broke. And if you can find a couple of friends to hang out with in town and maybe share a place with, uh, or if you can, you know, get into a neighborhood where you've got other people around you, now you've got stuff to do. You've got a little bit of meaning. You, you can you can gather with people and you can share, cut some of your costs a little bit. So I, I feel like that renaissance is happening I feel like it's being driven by these two big cohorts. We're kind of riding along the coattails as Xers. I hope that what I hope that what comes out of it is that we do it well enough. And there's some big questions about this on, on affordable housing and what have you, especially where you're at. I, I, I feel like if we can do this well enough, there won't be the push to go back. Right. But that's right. a big if, right? Yeah. So a, a, a big part of the challenge, of course, is, you know, is the land use and it is, you know, you know, having the ability to get to meaningful destinations. And so one of the chapters that that uh, you eventually lead up to is the reformation process and, yeah. and how how we can try to, uh, you know, uh, reform the transportation professionals in, in with with all due respect to to the fact that you know these are you know for the most part well-meaning people uh, that you know were just trying to do their jobs and 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 you know do the job that was put in front of them. Um, let's talk a little bit about the necessity for that reformation process. Yeah, the it is. Uh, I I have a lot of anger when I get to that chapter and a lot of frustration. And I think a lot of that is born out of the fact that I am at heart kind of an idealist. You know, I, I, I really 
embarked on my career uh, wanting to do good for society. And I, I look around at my fellow professionals and I think a lot of them have the same motivations. I mean, I, I don't know if I say this specifically in the book. I, th I think I do. I know I've said it many times publicly. I have met a lot of engineers, a ton of engineers in my life. I've worked with many. I don't know any of them that I would consider like bad, evil people. I, all of them seem to be very nice, very conscientious, uh, want to do good for society. I feel like what has happened, and a little bit of this is like the calcification that just comes with institutional institutionalizing things. I mean, when once you institutionalize things, you create its own constituency. There's kind of a, a, a it, it protects itself. It loses some of that early vibrancy. I think if we went back to the, uh, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s of the engineering profession, there was a lot more free thought and dynamism because they were literally like creating new systems to do things. And so there was more embracing of ideas, more embracing of, of innovations and what have you. Um, but as that ages, as that goes on, uh, it's become more like a, a, a rote practice um, where the institutional momentum is around protecting the position, the authority, the, uh, I mean, everything from, and we can maybe talk about the lawsuit in a, at some point, but, you know, the, the very words professional engineer are sacrosanct and, and protected in this very bizarre way. Um, all of this is inward looking. And, and I, I, inward looking for a profession to me means dying. It means diminishing and going away. It means becoming less than what it should be. And that's not what I signed, that's not what I signed up for. Um, I make the quote in the book that, you know, I, I signed up to uh, be, you know, in, a, in an analogy, um, I signed up to, to learn to be Michelangelo or be Picasso. Like I wanted to do amazing things. I wanted to build great things. I wanted to design stuff. And then I got out of school and you told me that my job was to just keep the copier full and run prints of old masters. Well, that, that, that's, not, that's, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not, I think, what most engineers want to do. And so I, I think there's an opportunity here to, in a sense, retask and re-inspire a profession and, and, and help them not see their place and their power and authority as coming from, uh, you know, being bishops and, and cardinals of ancient orthodoxy and like protectors of the, the you know, the golden chalice that cannot be, you know, touched or, or you know, whatever, and, and actually be people who are part of a revolution and innovation and, and how we change and do things within our well, and, conversation. And to to, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say to, to get to the point though, it's like, we're talking about changing what these places are. Yeah. Too. yeah. You know, it, it's like you do a good job of really honing in and defining the difference between a street and a road. And then we, we start talking about great streets and we start t talking about this concept of streets as meaningful places for people and the platform for building wealth and, and all of these things. But then you sort of redefine how we get there. Right. And you talk about the street design team. So there's a new role that you have envisioning for these, you know, professional engineers and planners. Talk a little bit about that, that new place in the hierarchy and, and what their role would be, because that's at the heart of, what you're talking about with a reformation. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like there's two ways to approach this. And and you, the way you frame the question is, is a little bit, got me, you know, on the second, which is how do engineers change and see their roles change? And I, I write in the book that, you know, I think if engineers don't begin studying things like complexity and begin studying more sociology and psychology, as opposed to, looking at cities as mechanical systems, looking at them as complex adaptive environments and having to understand people. Um, you know, you see this in the medical profession where there's an emphasis now on not bedside manner, but on actual like how humans work as these like weird things. You know, you, you don't just go in and give a diagnosis and walk out. Like part of healing someone is empathy. I, I think engineers actually have to, to stretch themselves to, to do that. 
I, I, my book, though, and, and the idea of the street design team, I think, is is more subversive in the sense that what it's doing is in the absence of engineers reforming themselves, which I think will come later. I don't think that's what's going to lead. It's actually a way to strip power from them in the design process. And understand what we've done. What we have said is that we're going to put from the federal government to the state government to the local government, we're going to put lots of money into transportation. And so what that has meant is that a lot of the problems we have become transportation problems, right? If, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If the only money that you have flowing in is transportation money, you will define every economic development, every housing, every public health problem in terms of transportation. That's what we do. When you funnel that money through, what that means is that it goes to some organization, a, a, a department, a project team, whatever, that is headed by a licensed engineer. And you get all the gatekeeping, all the rote approach, you get, you get all, it all runs through them. The book tries to prompt people to redefine that problem. So we're getting beyond everything just as a rote transportation problem. But also broaden that team out to ask more questions than just the technical engineering questions. The technical engineering questions are important. We need an engineer in our street design team. But if we're building a real street, we actually have to have knowledge of what the different components of that are. We, we need to understand the vegetation on that street. We need to understand the housing issues along that street, the economic development issues. We need to know, are, are, is there someone with an, uh, a very unique handicap that we should be accommodated in a special way through here? Is this a neighborhood full of young people or old people or middle-aged families? Like, what is it? How do we make this street work and adapt to them? That is not a mechanical process. That's a very adaptive, complex process. And, and part of setting it up that way is to actually shift power and authority away from the, the, the hierarchy silo kind of way we've done things into a more collaborative approach where all of these other ideas would actually lead and the engineer would be in service of that. As opposed to, and let me give you the, the caricature, and I say as a caricature, this is what most cities do. The engineer will do a project, they'll design everything, they'll lay it out, and then they'll ask people for comments. So let the park department, please comment on the engineer's plan. The housing department, please please comment on the engineer's plan. The neighborhood, please comment on the engineer's plan. And so what you have is like the starting conditions with uh, the, the, the amount of variation being very modest from what the engineer begins with. And what I want is to start the plan somewhere else and let the engineer comment on that, right? Like, okay, Sure, that's fine. Here's what you want to do. We also have to make sure we handle drainage. So here's what we've got to do. We also have to make sure we have the pavement thickness right. Or, you know, there's technical things we have to do, but that's not, should never be the thrust of the street right. design. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I like the way that you just frame that too, is, you know, the, you know, bring them in to be able to comment on it. And uh, while we're at, uh, you know, the, the, in the process of trying to quote unquote reform the system or reform the process uh it, also being able to reform some of the things that they then refer to like the mutcd oh, yeah. making sure that you know that sort of stuff that way their bibles that they refer to have have been adapted to reflect um the the new reality so you mentioned caricature yeah you start off the book with the caricature of a conversation with an engineer. Talk a little bit about that. It was so wonderful to be re reacquainted with uh, <laughs> what was once one of the most hilarious and tragic uh, videos and, and just went viral before, you know, before Strong before Towns was time. really big. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it was kind of a turning point for us. I, I sat down one Sunday night and uh, just put this together real quick. Um, it's an eight and a half minute video and it's two cartoon bears talking to each other, an engineer and, and a, a woman who is, um, has concerns about the project. And I, it's, it's amazing because when I put it together, I, I, 
I didn't have to work at the dialogue at all. The dialogue, it, I put it together as quick as I could write it. I didn't have to sit and think. I didn't have to map it out. It just, it just flowed. And it just flowed because I had been in that conversation so many times. I had spoken the words of that engineer so many times. I knew all the things that they should say. And I think the, and I'll use the word genius. I, I don't ascribe that to myself, but every now and then you can do certain things that are genius. The genius of this particular video is that it does have this, it does come full circle where the engineer actually is just reinforcing their own assumptions and their own priors and their own arguments with the, the, the person just asking very basic, very obvious questions and, and having the engineer just circle full around. Like, I have to do this because it's a standard. Why it's a standard? Because this is what we have to do. And it just goes around and around in a circle. With this book, I wanted to start with that because I, I, I think a lot of people interpreted it as me making fun of engineers or making fun of, you, you know, caricaturing the engineering profession. And what I was actually doing in 2011 or 2012 when I put that together is sharing things that had been in my head that I knew were wrong, like, you know, like connecting this. And so in the book, I not only share the dialogue, but I share the background. Um, what, what am I thinking? What is in my head as I go through and make these statements? Um, why would I assert certain things that this, this cartoon bear asserts? And it's funny because I, I talked to my mom and my mom has read the book and she calls me after every chapter and talks to me about it. And she said, uh, Chucky, I, I was reading that first chapter and I said, this, this does not sound like my boy. This is not very nice. I, I didn't really like where this was going. Um, and then she said, then I got to the end and I'm like, okay, now I, now I understand what you were doing, but she, I, I did not like you very much in that first chapter. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't like myself. Like, I, I don't think that a lot of those things that I thought, I, I have this dream, and I hope this is a reality. I, I have this dream that, um, you know, the, the, the thrust of this book is not for technical people. The, this book is for general audience, and it's for non-professionals. But I hope that some professionals pick it up and read it. And I hope as they're reading through that first chapter, they identify with the logic and the thought process that I lay forth, the engineer, because it will be a rude awakening for them when I get to the end of the chapter and say, this is my confession. Like all of that was wrong. Everything that I thought was wrong. And let me give you 12 chapters of, of why. Um, I hope that it in a sense reels them in and helps them question their priors as well. Yeah. So it was about a decade from when you first put that together, when you dusted it off and you dove in and, and how, how did it weather? I mean, Oh man, it must've been interesting to reflect on something that you yeah. put together, you know, and you wrote out right away and then it, then it blew up. How, how did it, you know, how did it age? That's been watched 350,000 times. Um, it, 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 I hope someday it looks antiquated and I hope someday we look at it and say, you know, that was maybe how engineers used to react, but that's not. But I mean, it's still is as relevant today as it's ever been. Um, I've had an opportunity a couple times to be in a room with a bunch of engineers while that video was played. So someone who wants to make a point or have engineers think differently, they will play that. A, a couple, one I was, once I was giving a speech and before I gave my speech, they played that video as like a warm up to me. And I was able to watch the, 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 prof, the professionals, the technical people in attendance. And this is a broad, this is a broad classification, not universal. So, so I'm painting with a broad brush. But generally, looking out at the audience, the, the engineers that were older than me or the people in the audience that were older than me were sitting there with their arms crossed. They had this scowl on their face. They, 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 they were not very happy. They, they didn't get what they were watching. And the engineers, the, the people in the room that were younger than me were laughing. They were clapping. They were patting each other on the back. They were high-fiving each other. They, they were having a hoot time. They thought it was hilarious. That gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of hope that, um, you know, some of this is just 
the way we've always done things, and it's really hard to look at 30 years of a career and say, I screwed this up. But if you're a young person and you haven't had that experience, you can be the reformer. And, and, and making that transition from one to the other, I think, is, is really important. Um, but I, I, I've, right now, it feels as, as relevant and urgent as it did 10 years ago. And I, I hope when the book comes out that people go look it up and, and, re, and watch it again and share it with people. Um, because it does, in an eight and a half minute video, I think completely destroy the engineering profession. I mean, it completely destroys uh, the credibility, really, of the whole thought process we bring to building transportation infrastructure in this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you what, if you're if you're watching this particular episode, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't I just edit that? Put right it right in. in. That'd be awesome. So let's let's put it right in at the end. So so you're watching this. Uh, you don't have to click on another link. We'll we'll edit that video right into uh, the the closing of of this particular episode. Chuck, is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure we we leave the audience with? That's an interesting question. Because, you know, the, the, whole, um, the whole paradigm we're trying to create is really, uh, l let me say this, you talked to Jason Slaughter a couple of weeks ago. And it's funny because I, I resist the idea of going to audiences and saying we should be the Netherlands, right? Um, and I do that probably for the same reason you do, because no one would listen to you, right? Like an American audience is not going to listen to you should be the Netherlands, right? That's just like, we're, we're not, and we're not gonna be. But the, but the reality is, is that engineers in the 70s in the Netherlands were facing the same things that we faced in the 70s and made a different choice, but, but really the same thing we're facing today. Lots of people being killed, public health going in the wrong direction, budgets blowing up and going in the wrong direction. Um, the, the difference between them, and, and, and I know there's a, there's a, there's a thought process that says, well, they're more thoughtful and more enlightened. And uh, yeah, no, they just were broke, right? They, 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 they had to deal with like the reality earlier than we have. We, we've been able to prop the zombie up and keep it going longer because we had more money, more wealth, more capacity, more whatever. Um, but when they had to deal with it, they went out and did something fundamentally different. And I think anyone from Holland reading my book today is going to say, yeah, this is like, well, this is what we do. Like you've, you've, you've just described what we do in, in the Netherlands. Um, I, I think that, uh, that, that what I hope is that what I've done here is taken what I think is common knowledge in other parts of the world, um, you know, taking the best of the American approach and the best of like a, 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 a different approach that has worked well in other places and interpreted it for a, a North American audience in a way where we can get from here to there. Yeah. Credibly. Well, right? and, and I agree. I, I, I would say that, yeah, the, the Dutch are really just 50 years ahead. They're, they're just 50 um, years ahead. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they were in very, very similar circumstances in the 1970s. They had multiple things happening, including the oil crisis, including a lot of the other uh, upheavals that were happening from a social unrest perspective. But they also just finally had had enough. And, right. and a lot of the, the parents, especially, uh, resisted this idea that we should be sacrificing our, our kids, you know, on the road. And that ends up being a, a, a key th common theme that goes throughout this book. And we'll end on this very quick little note, um, you know, about the, the tragedy that happened in, in Massachusetts. And I'm with you. I'm hoping that this is going to turn positive and we're going to be able to get past this and and make it a success story just like the the dutch have has seen happen so real quickly as our final little tidbit because i know you got to get going yeah that little thought about what happened in in springfield and hopefully a positive resolution moving forward into the future i i've kind of I, this is the one part of this whole book thing that i i'm i've kind of I'm, I'm prepared for, but I'm not prepared for. Cause um, 
it's tough to talk about. The, the entire, let's just call it literary device I used for this book was Springfield, Massachusetts. I start with uh, a crash, a, 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 a traffic incident that occurred on State Street in Springfield where a seven-year-old girl was, was killed. And the only reason I know about this was because I was there. I was there in Springfield that day. I had looked at the street and had people say, look at how dangerous this is. We need to get this fixed. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And then that very night, a, a little girl was killed crossing the street with her mom and, and her cousin. And it's it, there's, there's a part of me that feels very emotional about this and emotional in a way that um, I almost feel guilty about because People send me all the time links to articles about kids getting killed. I mean, I, I get them all the time. Uh, you know, this tragedy occurred, that tragedy occurred. And, and, and it's, it's hard for me to sustain the empathy for something that just recurs, you know, 10 times a day. Because literally, that, there's, there's 3,000 kids that are killed every year statistically on, on our roadways. It's very hard to, you know, have and sustain that amount of grief and empathy for that situation. But this one I was very, very close to. And I wrote an article the, the day it came out, you know, the, 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 that night, just kind of working through my emotions on it. And I, re I went back and reread it. And it's, it's very angry. I'm very mad. I'm, I'm mad at engineers. I'm mad at the people who did this because they went through and they took a street that was really dangerous. And in the guise of moving cars faster and quicker and at greater volumes made it way more dangerous. And the only reason they were able to do it is because it was a neighborhood of poor, disenfranchised people who couldn't speak up and fight it. You know, if that had been through like the wealthy neighborhood, they would have hired lawyers and attorney, you know, done all this delay and, you know, forced a different design. Here we go through the poor part of town. We got a terrible strode. We go through in, in the name of traffic and to get money from the state and, and to accommodate a casino and whatever. We make it worse. We make it more dangerous. And this girl and her family pay the ultimate price. Um, I, I use this as a, a literary device um, because it's such a clear and compelling case. But I'm also, there's a part of me that is, I was just going to swear, is really mad at the city of Springfield because they knew this going in, that this was an issue. They intentionally ignored it and allowed it to become worse. This girl died. That's a wake-up call in itself that they have ignored. There's advocacy groups there that have been begging them to do something. There are people who have run for city council on a platform of, I will fix this street. Um, and continuously throughout the process, the zombie momentum of the public works department, of some bureaucrats, of you know funding mechanisms have conspired to basically do nothing for you know what is now going on seven years plus of this thing. I actually wrote an open letter to the city of Springfield and I said, you have one of two options. Option number one is I will pro bono, no charge to you, come in and help you develop a plan to fix this street and make it safe for people. Or option number two, I will pro bono work on behalf of the next family who has someone die on this street in a lawsuit against you, your choice. And that blew up in the paper and people were talking about it and it, it created a buzz for like, you know, a week and then it went away. Um, I use this device of State Street because it's compelling and it means a lot to me and I, I get emotional about it. I also use it because every city in North America has a State Street. Every city. Well, you have a you have a State Street just a few blocks from Washington here. Street, right there in the middle of town. Everybody has this street where people are killed, where we know it's dangerous, where we know it should not be this way, but yet it persists, and it persists despite all of us knowing how terrible it is. Um, yeah. And to be clear, when we talk about it, it's dangerous. Really, the key thing is the design encourages fast moving traffic. It's prioritized to move motor vehicles through in great numbers at great velocity. And when you talked about earlier 
you know, being able to transform these streets to be able to create greater wealth and greater prosperity. I wanted to also say greater levels of safety, greater health and well-being. Um, these are the. This is what we're talking about when we say hashtag slow the cars. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is what we're talking about is doing that. That was a little unfair to to give that to you right at no, the end. No, it's good. I, I know you need to get going. No, we're good. I'm 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 trying to find a way. Yeah, I'm trying to find a way to talk about because I I feel like you know I'm I'm this I'm not really like this macho guy or anything, but I also don't want to turn into like a a bubbling idiot. You know, I we did a podcast on this and and right after this happened, my board and I were having a board meeting and a couple of my board members interviewed me about this because I'd just written this thing and they're like, let's do a podcast on it. And I, I start crying in the middle of the podcast. Like this is a very, uh, this is a horrible thing that happened to a little girl. That's the, it was the same age as my kid, like a, like a week before Christmas. Um, I, 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 the, the biggest fear that I have with this book is uh, that it's, I, 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 I don't want to exploit a young girl's death and tragedy, um, you know, to make this larger point. I, I hope that throughout this, I've been respectful of, of her, of her family, of the situation. And, you know, it, it, is a, it is a really tough thing because someone lost their little kid and they lost their little kid because of the engineering profession and the way engineers chose to design and then you know disallow themselves from modifying in any way this street and that's a that's a that's a common thing we all share across north america you know well and i'll expand the the responsibility you know even broader than just the engineers of of saying that you know we as as society and as communities we we got to the point of where that's kind of what our level of expectation was and part of that whole new newly redesigned street design team that you you talk about engaging members of the community and and a higher level of responsibility for the elected officials right. of being able to participate in that process so that they are are not in that situation where you know they're sort of being <laughs> you know the dog that you know had you know yeah. being wagged by the tail. I mean, you know, they're they're actually have some some skin in the game yeah. in terms of educating themselves, getting up to speed on on what this means to be able to create streets for people and safe places, yeah. safe environments. Well, when you have so, a majority yeah. of the city council in the city of Springfield, Massachusetts, that wants a change, like wants this remedied, and the mm -hmm. answer that they get is we can't do it. It's not possible. Um, right. Well, and we're going to leave that as a teaser. Yeah. You want, because that is the teaser that I think people need to pick up this book and, and do this because that's one of the sub themes uh, of this is that relationship between the city, the city council that we would like to see change. And then, you know, how, uh, the profession right. responds to that right. and, and that drama that plays out. It was beautifully written. It was very, very impactful. There was that common theme and, and, and through line there. And but that was a, a wonderful part of it because it it you know, there was that cliffhanger of, you know, how is, you know, the profession going to be responding to this overwhelming sort of momentum to change this street. Yeah. And so folks Pick up the book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, Transportation for a Strong Town, published by Wiley. It's out September 8th, available everywhere. Fine books are sold. Uh, if you've got a favorite local bookstore, make sure that you uh, hit them up for it. I will say that out on Amazon right now, though, your pre-sale status, you're currently ranked number one in the yeah. new release for <laughs> urban and land use uh, planning category. Great stuff. Thanks, man. Congratulations for, for all of that. You're going to be busy. I'm going to see you next week. I haven't told you this yet, but I'm going to be live streaming your Sweet. Uh, your, your presentation right. from the library. So well, I better make it a uh, good we'll one. Be, then. You better make it a good <laughs> one. Hey, what's the best way for folks to follow along with Strong Towns? Well, the book, you can go to confessions.engineer, 
And that sounds like a weird URL, but that is actually the URL. We bought a dot right. engineer URL. So go, go, go get all the information on the book, including starting September 8th, there'll be supplemental material. So nice. links to maps and everything else. Um, strongtowns.org is our website and every day we're publishing two, three articles, all the podcasts, all that stuff. We're on social media at strong towns everywhere. So yeah. It's fantastic. Chuck, thank you so very Thanks, much Fred. for all your support over the years and uh, for joining me today on the Active Towns podcast. Likewise. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. <laughs> well, I'll see you yeah, soon. Yeah, see you soon. Right. <laughs> thank you all so much for watching this very special video podcast episode featuring my good friend Chuck Morona, Strong Towns. I'm going to start his conversation with an engineer video in just one moment, but just a quick reminder to subscribe and click on that bell if you want to make sure that you won't miss any new content as I put it out there. And if you feel so inclined to help support my efforts to produce this content, you can make a donation to Active Towns as a nonprofit or become a patron on our Patreon page. The links are in the video description. Well, without further delay, let's get rolling with Conversations with an Engineer. This is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Hello. I'm a project engineer. I heard you have a concern about the street improvement we have planned for your neighborhood. Yes. I heard you are planning to improve my street. What will this mean for my neighborhood? We plan to correct deficiencies in the grade, as well as deficiencies in the curvature of the existing alignment. We also plan to enhance the clear zone, in order to bring the street up to an acceptable and safe standard. So you are going to make the street more safe? Yes, of course. And how are you going to make the street more safe? Well, first we are going to correct deficiencies in the grade and the alignment. What does that mean? It means the grade and alignment of the street do not meet the standard, and so we are going to fix that. What is the standard? Basically, the street must be relatively flat and straight. So you are going to make the street flat and straight? Yes. How does it improve safety? It will allow cars to navigate more smoothly, which makes it more safe. I don't understand. Along with fixing deficiencies with the grade and the alignment, we will be widening the driving lanes. What will that do? It will improve safety. How does widening the lanes improve safety? Along with fixing the deficiencies in the grade and the alignment, it will allow traffic to flow more smoothly. What do you mean by allowing the traffic to flow more smoothly? How does it improve safety? Cars will be able to move without worrying about hitting things, so it will be more safe. That is why we are also expanding the clear zone. What do you mean by expanding the clear zone? We will be removing obstacles from the clear zone to improve safety. What is the clear zone? It is the area on each side of the street that we need to keep clear of obstacles in case cars go off the road. What kind of obstacles? Mostly trees. So you are going to remove the trees from the clear zone to improve safety? Yes. Exactly. How big is the clear zone? The clear zone is 25 feet on each side of the street. 25 feet. That is my entire front yard. I'm sorry, but the standard requires that, for the road to be safe, all obstacles must be removed from the clear zone. Do you understand that my children play in this clear zone? I would not recommend that. It would not be safe. But it is safe today. I thought you were doing this project to improve safety. How is the street more safe if my children can't go outside? Building the street to meet the standard will enhance safety by allowing cars to flow more smoothly. More smoothly, the cars will just drive faster, will they not? We will post a speed limit after we do a speed study and determine the safe speed for the street. But cars drive slow now. Slow is the safe speed through my neighborhood, where my children are playing in my yard. How does it improve safety to have a drag strip out my front door? It will increase safety because traffic will flow more smoothly. That is the standard. I am not aware of anyone being killed in an accident on this street and I have lived here for 30 years. Are you aware of anyone being killed? No, I'm not. I am not even aware of any accidents that have occurred on this street. Are you aware of any accidents? No, I'm not. Then why do you say that the street is not safe today? The street is not safe because it does not meet the standard. So today cars drive slow, and it is safe, but you want to flatten the street, straighten the street, widen the street and remove all of the trees, so cars can drive fast. Then post a speed limit, so they slow down. 
And you say this is more safe? Yes, it will meet the standard. And please understand, there are high traffic projections for this street. What do you mean, a high traffic projection? We project that a lot of cars will use this street in the coming years. Why would a lot of cars drive down this street? It is a small, narrow street where you have to drive slow. That is why we have to improve it to meet the standard. Won't that just encourage more people to use the street? We have anticipated that and are adding two more lanes to handle the additional cars. You are adding two more lanes? Yes. For cars? Yes. An additional two lanes will allow the street to meet the standard. Let me see if I understand. You are projecting a high volume of traffic where there is none today and then building a street to handle this traffic. Aren't you just encouraging more people to drive? No. We are anticipating a lot of growth and need to make this improvement to handle the growth. Where is all of this growth happening? New growth is being created in the tax subsidy zone. Where is the tax subsidy zone? The tax subsidy zone is on the edge of town. What kind of new growth is going to occur in the tax subsidy zone on the edge of town? There is a proposal for a grocery store as well as a drive through restaurant and a gas station. Okay. But I go to the neighborhood grocery store across the street. And I eat at the restaurant up the block. And I don't drive much, so I don't need another gas station. Yes, we know. That is why we have planned for a pedestrian overpass on this block. What is a pedestrian overpass? It is a bridge that will allow you to safely get from one side of the street to the other. But I can walk across the street safely right now. My kids can walk across the street safely right now. Why will I need a pedestrian overpass? With four lanes for traffic you will not be able to walk across the street without slowing down the cars. Slowing down the cars would not be safe. But I am not going to be able to haul my baby stroller up a pedestrian overpass every time I want to cross the street to buy milk. How does this benefit me? You will benefit from the added tax base from the new growth. But the new growth is in a tax subsidy district. How much will they contribute to the tax base? Nothing today, but in 10 to 15 years they will contribute a lot to the tax base. Why would we make an investment that will not start to pay back for 10 to 15 years? By then the grocery store will be turned into a dollar store and there will be a new tax subsidy zone. If we did not provide the subsidies and invest in improving streets, the growth would not happen. Without growth, our city would die. But if I can't walk across the street to the grocery store, it will go out of business. If I can't walk up the street to go to the restaurant, it will go out of business. Nobody is going to want to buy my house with a highway outside my front door. Do you care that my neighborhood is dying? Yes. That is why we are investing in new growth. That is why we are improving the street. So how much will this street improvement cost? The total project cost is $9 million. $9 million. Our city is broke. We can't afford to keep the street lights on overnight. We have laid off our firefighters and half our police force. Where are we getting $9 million? $7 million is stimulus money coming from the state and federal governments. The other $2 million will be assessed to the property owners that benefit from the project. What does that mean, assessed to the property owners that benefit from the project? It means that the property owners that benefit will pay a share of the cost. Who is it that benefits from the project? Everyone that is on the street. Wait. Are you saying that I benefit from this project and will pay an assessment? Yes. You are one of the benefiting property owners that will be assessed for the project. You must be kidding me. I have a nice, quiet neighborhood street today. My kids play in the yard and it is safe. I can walk across the street to the grocery store or up the street to the restaurant and it is safe. To make it more safe, you are going to flatten, widen, and straighten my street, and add two more lanes of fast-moving cars. This is done because of traffic projections, because we want new growth in the tax subsidy area on the edge of town. And while my neighborhood crumbles and my home drops in value, you are going to assess me too. I'm sorry, but the traffic projections require a four-lane street. For safety reasons we must follow the standard. And you wonder why we are broke. We need to stop this nonsense and start building strong towns. To learn more go to strongtowns.org.